within each human being, there's a certain weakness and woundedness and vulnerability. And often what we use to defend ourselves is pride. So in that sense, pride is not a manifestation of strength, as many people tend to imagine it to be, but rather it's, it's a manifestation of, of weakness and insecurity. Here we go. Welcome to a special edition of the Focusing Way podcast. I'm your host, David Battistella. We call these special editions The Way is Love. Find The Focusing Way on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and our website, thefocusingway.com. Today on a special edition of the Focusing Way podcast, we're talking about the virtue of humility. No matter what times humanity is living in, or humanity has lived through, humility is the one human virtue that is the cornerstone to all virtues. Humility is regarded as the foundational virtue, and it is said that there is not one soul in heaven who does not possess this virtue. The 14th century writer Thomas Akempis may be best known for his most famous work, The Imitation of Christ. But now, in a new volume by Tan Books, they have uncovered an important work simply titled Humility and the Elevation of the Mind to God. My guest today is Father Robert Nixon, OSB, a Catholic priest and a monk of the Benedictine Abbey of the Most Holy Trinity in New Norcia, Western Australia. Father Nixon has translated this work, making it available for the first time in the English language. Father Robert Nixon, welcome to The Way is Love on the Focusing Way podcast. Thank you very much, David. I'm very pleased to be with you uh, today. We're going to speak about humility today, but I wanted to begin with uh, a bit of an understanding of Thomas Akempis. I mean, here's here's a man who was born in 1380, right? And um, how does the writing and a life of a person born so long ago have relevance and impact on the Christian life today? Well, uh, that's a very interesting question. On a certain level, the issues of human life, human interactions, our relationship with God and with our fellow human beings are really uh, an eternal matter um, in that they don't change so much from one age to another. And we look back and we think, well, that was so many centuries ago that he was writing. But when we read the words of Thomas Akempis, we can uh, often be struck, as indeed I'm often struck, by by realizing that these words could be written today about situations and issues and problems which people are experiencing in the modern world. So our human condition is something which remains more or less constant despite the changes which take place in the external garb and so forth um, of our society. But, But within our hearts, the same forces are always at play, the same needs and desires, the same aspirations and fears, the same virtues and the same vices. Um, So because Thomas Akempis tends to look beyond the externals and into the inner reality of the heart, I think there's a timeless quality to his writing, which makes it just as relevant today as what it ever was. Um, Another level, though, is that the time when Thomas Akempis was writing, which was right at the end of the Middle Ages, um, leading to the commencement of of what we call the modern era, um, was a time of great social transition, um, of questioning of certain underlying realities and values and so forth. And I think it's got a particular resonance with our own times because we also find ourselves in times of, of transition when things which we had formerly assumed to be constant and reliable, now suddenly start to be uh, put under question. So Mm -hmm. I think that's a a kind of double resonance there uh, with Thomas Akempis and and why his writing, I think, still speaks so powerfully to the modern reader. I agree. And, you know, as I read the book, I was so impressed uh, by the early formation of Thomas, you know, who at only 13 was taken into a fraternal community, um, and 
was educated by pious men. So could you set the scene a little bit for life at the yes, time, yes. you know, when so he was he, being he formed? Has, um, yes, yes. So his his life story is quite remarkable. And, um, of course, he's famous for the imitation of Christ, but people often uh, don't look much beyond that to, to the person behind it. And he was uh, born in Germany um, in the Diocese of Cologne. His parents were of fairly um, well humble or middle-class situation. His father was a blacksmith and his mother was a school instructor. Um, he was born um, as, uh, with a twin brother, and the twin brother was born uh, just before him. Now, it happened that the twin brother was destined immediately for religious life. He was sent to join uh, the canons regular, the uh, Augustinian canons. And um, Thomas, though, um, was initially sent to join this uh, community called the, the Brotherhood of Common Life to undertake his studies there. Now, this Brotherhood of Common Life um, had some characteristics of a religious order, the people would live in community, um, observe particular common rules, share in common prayer and so forth. But on the other hand, um, there were no vows or anything. So mm -hmm. it was a, a little bit, I guess, could be compared to a, to a, a, a Catholic or religious-based college, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So Thomas was in this situation, and he was supported by a, a number of very great and holy men. And it was a wonderful situation for him to develop both his uh, spiritual life as well as his um, learning, which then, of course, provided the basis for his ability later on to, to assist others in their uh, spiritual journeys. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in this formal education, Thomas left behind not only a liter literary legacy, but he was also known for staying awake all hours of the night, reading and copying manuscripts and preserving ancient texts. And I just want to read this quote from the book. Uh, so this is directly from the book, quote, out of the books he copied in this manner, there remains an ex in existence a complete Bible, a missal, and many of the writings of St. Bernard of Clairvaux. These superb manuscripts attest both to the artistry of his penmanship and the magnitude of his industry, unquote. So, Father Nixon, you yourself are a musician and a composer, and you also translate books and these texts. So how do you react when you read or read the passages like the one I just read? Yeah, um, well, I find it very inspiring. So I'm a, a Benedictine monk, of course, and throughout most of the history of the Benedictine order, um, one of the main activities of our monasteries has been the copying of books, of course, before the advent of printing. Um, for books to survive and be circulated, it depended upon people copying them by hand. And this is something which Thomas took up, you know, he, he made, it's believed he made four complete copies of the Bible. We have one in existence today, as well as um, vast uh, amounts of other literature by people like Bernard of Clairvaux and Augustine and so forth. Um, so the value of this copying uh, process, as well as making um, extra volumes available for other readers was it was a very kind of intense, concentrated reading for him. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for myself, this resonates very deeply because one of the activities in which I'm involved um, is translation. And um, for me, as a monk, this is almost like a continuation of the scriptoriums of the past centuries. Of, um, of of uh, applying efforts to make these texts accessible, and um, and part of doing that involves reading them very deeply and intently. Um, mm -hmm. So I I, I, I uh, derive a lot of spiritual nourishment from this process, because in translating from Latin to English, you know, it's one thing to understand the Latin, but then to think about how can this best be expressed in English. So it uh, involves then a, 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 a deeper penetration of the meaning of the texts. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was something which was very important to Thomas uh, Akempis because he wasn't compelled to undertake this extra work, but it was something which he really loved. And um, I think it, it behooves us always to bear in mind that we have a limited 
um, expanse of time in this earthly life uh, and that we should use it in, in the most profitable way we can towards advancing our relationship with God. So um, the belief of, of not allowing any time to be wasted, I think, was something which we see powerfully put into practice in the life of Thomas de Kempis. And it also offers a, a wonderful example, I believe, for contemporary Catholics. We live in a world in which wasting of time is, um, is almost a, a major industry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Consider the amount of time that people spend on the internet and so forth. I read recently that the average person in the Western world spends a third of their waking life looking at mobile phone screens. Mm. I think, well, yeah. is this the best thing to be doing <laughs> yeah. when we have... Yeah, so um, so I think Thomas Akempis offers us, and all the monastic saints of old, um, of, of using the time which God gives us as a precious gift and an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as we're speaking, you know, there could be people listening saying, wow, what, what a serious life, what, a, what an intense kind of way of living and everything. But it's, you know, I don't want to, um, I wanted to introduce this because there is also an element of humor. And when a fellow brother commented on Thomas's reverence for prayer, um, because he was quite pious, saying that, Quote, Thomas savors the Psalms as if he were eating fine fish. Kempis writes him a limerick in response. And it, this is what it is. I'll just quote from the book. The salmon is a wonderful fish. Well cooked, it is a tasty dish. But if consumed without due care, can health and even life impair? And thus the Psalms, if sung with heart, all joys of heaven shall impart. But if with spirits dull they're read, can leave one soul dismayed and dead. So I just, when I read that, I thought about the way they were interacting, the life they had um, in the monastery. And the book carries these insights about campus that frames the religious life of a, the 14th century a little differently than we might imagine. Uh, yeah, but, you yeah, know, it also it, it, shows a, a tremendous amount of kindness you know, and yes, uh, and it, it does inform it, about his virtues. Yes, indeed, it does. It does indeed. And um, interestingly, that that uh, that short poem which you just read there, it features a, a pun which is not so obvious in English as it is in Latin. But between the word psalm and semen, mm -hmm. so there's a kind of connection there. But um, one of the things about uh, Thomas Akempis, uh, which we see both in his life story and his writing, was that he was he was actually very humane and uh, and tolerant, and sometimes people imagine that the the imitation of Christ and the other writings of uh, Thomas Akempis are all kind of very severe and dour and so forth, and in reality they're not. He shows a, a great sensitivity to to people's struggles and the need for. Um, for human support as well, and, and kindness being the essential thing. You know, each of us needs kindness in our life, and each of us um, owes to each other this element of kindness. And, of course, humour is a very important part of um, monastic life, of religious community life in general, as well as all our human interactions, because... Um, conveys a certain charity and, and, and love, you know, and, and a readiness to forgive. So, you yeah. know, I think the message of being able to joke with someone shows that you're, you know, that you're, you're open to them, that you really value them and so forth. And, and I think this is one of the aspects of monastic uh, life and, and medieval spirituality in general, which, um, which we tend perhaps to overlook a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you do. That's a part of being in a family and a fraternal living is to be able to laugh as well uh, with one another. Yes, yes. Well, it's a, it's a it's a wonderful way of um, of expressing of expressing acceptance and and love. So, mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Uh, he doesn't really waste words. And one thing I love about this book is really the direct and instructive form of language used and. Even though the words sometimes come across, or the sentences may seem sort of simple, 
when you actually reflect on them and their implementation of what, you know, how you would implement what is being said, it really uh, provides us with an opportunity to overcome some parts of our internal life or, you know, to take to our mental prayer. But what what do you think is maybe the greatest obs- obstacle for gaining or learning this virtue of humility? I think one of the uh, great obstacles to humility is the fact that the chief opponent of humility, pride, is something which tends to disguise itself. So it's often relatively easy to recognize pride in other people. But when it comes to recognizing pride in our own hearts, then that can often be a real struggle. Um, So uh, I don't know about you, but for myself, you know, I often find myself thinking other people are being proud. But, you know, then um, it takes a a moment of reflection to realize that it's something of pride in myself, which is making me feel that way. Mm -hmm. Um, So pride is this kind of hidden vice. And I'll I'll read you a little bit from his text on humility, talking about pride. And he said, hidden pride is a most pernicious vice, the more so since it is not recognized and does not recognize itself. On the outside, it may appear gentle, mild, and even humble, yet inside it burns away bitterly. The person who is subject to such pride becomes inordinately elated when they are successful, but is disturbed and dejected in the face of adversity or failure. Mm. And this pride is a hidden thing in our hearts because we all have it as part of our fallen human nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, it manifests itself often in in unexpected ways, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that's uh, something we need to, to look out for very intently. Whenever we feel hurt or offended or slighted or something, a good first step is to look and say, well, is it, is it actually my own pride which is causing this problem? And in, in a lot of cases, at least for myself, I find that it is. So the recognition of, of the force of pride and its effect in determining our thoughts and our actions is, is one of the primary steps to, to taking uh, the journey towards humility. My um, Italian grandmother had a saying uh, which sort of encapsulates this, which is when you point a finger at someone else, always remember you have three pointing back at yourself. Yes, yes, very good. That's, and, uh, a, that's that, a very true saying, I think. That's something I've always sort of kept with me. as like, And it's also this idea of thinking three times before pointing a finger at anybody. Uh, so it, it is a, a sort of something we can put into our, uh, to interrupt our, our tendencies. Um, uh, so, yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. And there's a beautiful other quote I just wanted to pull from the book here. Um, and he says... Quote, and Christ teaches us humility, not pride. He teaches us useful things, not vanities. He teaches us what is true, not what is false, what is heavenly, not what is earthly. How is humility a weapon for a Christian? Well, humility is, is I think, a very powerful weapon because it serves to to um, combat and to recognize pride which is the devil's um, first sin and it's a kind of primary sin leading to the fall of humanity we think that it was um, the the aspirations of Eve and Adam to attain to this higher state which led them to taste the apple and then to be expelled from paradise Um, within each human being, there's a certain weakness and woundedness and vulnerability. And often what we use to defend ourselves is pride. Mm. So in that sense, pride is not a manifestation of strength, as many people tend to imagine it to be, but rather it's it's a manifestation of, of weakness and insecurity. So by cultivating humility, we're looking at ourselves objectively, we're realizing that we're not always perfect 
that we're sometimes in the wrong, that it's not always the other person who's making the mistake, but ourselves. And even if it is the other person who's making a mistake, that's not to say that we're completely free of fault. So the coming to terms with our own weaknesses and shortfallings is the first step to um, advancement in virtues. Now, uh, if I could give you a, a comparison, if, if you had a person who was involved in, in some particular form of work or endeavour or something, and they insisted that their work was always perfect, then they would have no capacity for improvement. Mm. So it's only when you identify your faults and shortcomings and are willing to see them objectively and realistically that you can then begin to, to correct them and to move forward. So I think in that sense, it's a, a wonderful uh, weapon for, uh, for Christians in the spiritual life. And the ultimate humility, of course, was exhibited by Christ himself, who was true God, but then accepted all of the fragilities and the limitations of our human condition. Now, as for ourselves, the limitations and fragility of our human condition is, is our natural state. Mm. So our, our willingness to, to accept this is our first step to going beyond it. So we need to recognize before we can be saved, our need to be saved. Mm. Um, before we can be forgiven, we need to, to acknowledge our own sinfulness. Before we can move to something higher and greater, we need to acknowledge the reality of where we are at the moment. So I think in that context, humility is, is, is a wonderful uh, step. And, and it's almost a um, virtually infallible um, resource if we're in ever in a situation of, of perplexity or agitation or temptation humility can um, can serve to to ward off those things to ground us again firmly in reality mm -hmm. yeah um, you know the other thing about this book and I'm sure people are realizing as they listen is that there's a there's a deep opportunity for contemplation and it can be taken in very small pieces and I wanted to mention um, for our listeners that there are beautiful series of woodcut illustrations between the pages of this book and they're lovely images to reflect on um, you know if you find yourself with this book in your hand in prayer or in a quiet time there's always an image to turn to um, and it really does feel like a kind of a reference book that you want to have near you at all times to be able to reach for. And anyone who's listening may maybe even just be thinking about how to train oneself or, you know, cultivate humility. Could you share some thoughts on that? Yes, yeah. Well, um, uh, David, I very much like the word you said about training yourself. So our spiritual life is really one of, of training. Um, of the word ascesis in Greek means training, so it's the basis of, of the English word ascetic. So the idea of, that our spiritual life is not just a matter of reading particular lessons and so forth, but it's continuous work putting them into practice, you know. And um, we uh, are all called to to, uh, to struggle for this moral improvement, because through this moral improvement, we um, begin to purify ourselves of the things which attach us to this lower realm. Mm -hmm. We think about all the various vices that can affect a person, um, greed, lust, sloth, and so forth. They all serve to... Um, I would say, ground us, but not in a good way. They bring us to our lower nature, and they give a certain dominance to the material or animal side of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, humility is a recognition that those lower forces are at work within ourselves, and it's only by recognizing them that we're able to overcome them. And this overcoming of the lower forces within ourselves then opens the door to the wonderful experience of contemplation. So um, I sometimes like to think about the analogy which Plato uh, uses of the human being as being like a, a chariot being drawn by two horses. And one of these horses is leading us downwards and one of them is leading us upwards. Mm. 
So we have these vices, these um, carnal desires, these lower psychological impulses of self-defense and self-assertion and so forth, which bring us downwards. But our, each of us has a soul formed in the image of God. And the natural tendency of this soul is towards union with God, um, towards what is eternal, towards what is good and perfect in an absolute sense. And so contemplation is our, our foretaste of this. It's our means of approaching this, even while we're still here on earth. And, and it, of course, it's something which we need to train on, to work ourselves in every day. Um, I think the spiritual life is its a little bit like playing a musical instrument or, or doing a sport or learning a language or something. Uh, it's not enough just to read the book and then put it on the shelf, but it needs to be continually worked at. And I think that it's in this sense that books like, like this one and other spiritual writings of this type are so useful because they're not books you just read once and say, I'm finished with it but uh, books which you can read and read again. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is something which was very much part of the traditional monastic approach to reading, that you didn't just read something once and were done with it, but you, you would revisit it. Yes. And um, I, I, I hope that that's the case with this book, that, that it's, it's the kind of thing which a person can revisit many times and each time they revisit, we'll find different shades of meaning and different depths hidden within it. I think that's certainly true. And one of the things, uh, you know, the, the section of prayers in humility and the elevation of the mind to God is really robust. And um, one thing I noticed going through the prayers was that, you know, we've kind of reduced our prayer life to two very short prayers, one to Our Lady and one to Our Father. And the prayers in this book go on for pages. And it, it was also a testament to the times of like how much people, how much reverence people uh, understood they needed to have before uh, God. And, I, you know, you mentioned detachment earlier, uh, and there's a beautiful prayer for detachment of earthly things. Um, oh, yes. Uh, but, you know... You see, there's. can you talk about this in terms of how this fervent love that Kempis had for God and how we kind of see this true love in in the lives of the saints, really? And I'm just yeah. wondering, that sense of, like, being able to write prayers that are that devote. You know, do you have a favorite or, like, or yes, just... Sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. I, well... Well, um, yes, I, I do. And, you know, I think this, this practice of writing prayers is, um, for, for Thomas, was a matter of pouring out his heart to God, you know. And, of course, we can say, um, you know, prayers according to existing formulas. But I think there's always a certain um, merit in, in kind of coming up with our own prayers because it, it makes us look more deeply to examine our own hearts and to see what's in there and to offer it all before God. And, you know, um, when you ask me if I have a favorite, well, I, I, I do, but to be honest, um, in a way they're all favorites. But I think the one you mentioned of detachment from earthly things is, is uh, very strong. And um, he talks here, um, this is one of the prayers, it's a prayer that the mind may be freed from its bondage to the things of the physical senses. And that's a really key thing. As I mentioned before, you know, our, our souls have this tendency towards heaven, but because of the fall of humanity, we also have this downward tendency, mm. which imprisons us in the world of the physical senses. And if we think about our human condition a little bit, all of our sorrows and unhappiness actually come from excessive attachment to the physical world. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll read you a little bit of this prayer, if you don't mind. Yes, uh, absolutely. Because, uh, okay. I earnestly beseech you, my God, and pray to you from the very depths of my being. Free me and rescue my soul, which is currently distracted and held captive by all kinds of earthly cares, worries, and desires. By the radiance of your enlightenment, may I discover you within myself, O God. For truly you fashioned me in your own divine, precious, and incorruptible image. 
Indeed, the beauty and likeness of your supreme wisdom does not shine forth in any created thing in the world as much as it does in the human soul. You made the human soul alone with the capacity to know and to love you, and through the gift of reason, placed it above all other things in creation. Lord, raise up my mind from all earthly concerns and purify the affection of my heart. Renew me according to the interior man which you lovingly created. Repair your divine image within me through the sevenfold grace of the Holy Spirit. Truly you have made the human soul as something immortal, invisible and incorporeal, capable of receiving the eternal truth, uniquely blessed with reason and self-awareness, and for this reason surpassing all other things. On account of this reason and self-awareness, it is more worthy than any visible or perceptible thing to bear the image of God. O Lord, remove and expel from me whatever is able to stain or darken your image, lest it should become unworthy of your kindly gaze. Deign to renew this most precious and noble image of yourself which is within me by the power of your love. Illuminate it with the gift of your intelligence and visit it without ceasing. For in your omnipotence, it is you alone who hold it in being. And in your omniscience, you perceive and comprehend it always and in full. Of course, I am not worthy to drink from the springs of living water which flow into eternal life. But please, O Lord, visit me frequently, and in your love, help me to raise myself above all earthly distractions and all lower realities, and to see you alone, for you are the one eternal goodness. Let me seek you above all else, and love you completely, for your sake alone. Amen. Amen. So much is evoked in those words. And as you were reading that, the image of having that personal relationship, like writing a letter to God um, and entering into that through that kind of contemplation, it's precisely what this book offers people. They see yes. physically the opportunity of a person who had those conversations in written form, and I'm sure in mental prayer and in, in also in um, daily prayer, uh, but that it, that it exists. And I'm just, is it any surprise to you now, look, like 600 years later, you know, that really our entire world has become precisely about disordered attachment to worldly things? Yeah. And that the, this is now still available to us. Yes, it, it, it has very much, you know, and um, of course there are forces in the world in whose interest it is to attach us as strongly as possible to earthly things and to minimize the aspect of, of the spiritual life within the human being. Um, and by doing that, they haven't advanced human happiness at all. If we look back, I believe, at the last uh, 500 years of human history, Despite all the technological and uh, economic advancements, if we were to ask, are human beings happier today than they were in the Middle Ages? Um, I think in most cases the answer would be no. And uh, this is one of the things which I think in general our culture is lost, a sense of the spiritual reality and the fact that we are really made in the image of God, and we're called to the glory of heaven. And in the context of that, all of our earthly troubles and worries and desires and so forth begin to seem very unimportant. And now, when you hear the word humility, you know, a lot of people might imagine that it's more or less the same as low self-esteem, as being kind of downcast and oppressed and so forth. But I think it's quite the opposite of that because it's pride which attaches us to the lower part of our nature. Mm. It's pride which makes us to become enslaved by the things of this world. And in humility, in casting off that pride, in recognizing it for the illusion that it is, we attain to this true inner freedom and uh, inner happiness, which then doesn't oppress us, but on the contrary, 
opens the door to this wonderful elevation to to what is eternal, to what's truly good and to what truly matters. So I think it's a great, it's a call to freedom, this humility. Yeah, and um, it's just, it's just such a a wonderful um, thing that you've just expressed there. Uh, that it just feels like such a good moment, unless you feel like there's anything else you wanted to share. Um, to to close on that point and to encourage people to look at humility, look at virtues, uh, and yeah. do an examination, you know, even a small one, uh, and bring that into their yeah. life. Yes, yes. Well, I think it's very uh, appropriate, uh, David, that we're talking on on today on the Feast of the Purification of the Blessed Virgin Mary, um, which is also uh, the Feast of the Presentation of Our Lord in the Temple. And both Jesus and the Blessed Virgin Mary had absolutely no need to undergo these rituals, but they did them as a pure expression of humility. But they weren't worried about defending their, their status or their pride or their rights and so forth. But they saw these as nearly earthly things which it was fitting for them to do at the time, and they did them. And in that there was a wonderful surrender to the will of God. I would encourage all people today to bear in mind always the examples of Christ and of the Blessed Virgin. In Christ we see God himself who took on all the humility and the lowliness of our human condition, um, who consented to the ultimate suffering. We see in the Blessed Virgin Mary a person who was absolutely immaculate, the crowning splendor of creation and, and free from all um, the taints of sin, which are such a part of life for most of us. And yet, when we look at her life, we see a life of, of humility, of obedience to the will of God, um, of accepting her role as the, uh, the wife of Joseph and the mother of Jesus. So we see these splendid examples, and I think it's great for each of us to look at ourselves often, you know, at least once a day, and in particular when we find ourselves hurt and offended in, and in conflict, and to ask ourselves, you know, is there any pride going on here? And of course, the answer is almost always yes, there is some pride going on because we're all weak human beings and we're uh, infected by these various taints of sin. The very act of recognizing it um, to a substantial extent contributes to liberating ourselves from it. So when we recognize that it's only an illusion, that it's an error and so forth, then we've, we've taken the first step towards liberating ourselves from it and to becoming what God really calls us to be. Father Nixon, I'd like to thank you very much for the time you took today, for the wisdom that you shared, and for the work you did to bring the very first uh, version of this work in English so that uh, a whole new audience can experience the spiritual strength uh, in the words um, and of this uh, blessed person. Thank you so much, David. God bless you. The book is Humility and the Elevation of the Mind to God by Thomas Akempis, translated by our guest today, Father Robert Nixon. Like and subscribe on thefocusingway.com. Listen to us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Spotify.